This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the early 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now I am so friggin' excited for today's episode because I will be talking to Stacy Glick. She played Bree Mitchell in the 1987 teen cult classic, very underrated teen cult classic, Three O'Clock High. She was so awesome in that movie, and I love that character. And uh, we're going to be talking today. She was also Jonathan Silverman's sister in Neil Simon's Brighton Beach memoirs. She was in the Benneker Gang with Andrew McCarthy. And she got out of the business. Uh, she became a literary agent up in New York. And we're going to talk about all of that today, and I can't wait. And it's going to be a great show today. This is the next to last um, pre-Thanksgiving episode before Thanksgiving, and I'm pretty happy about it. I'm so grateful for all you who listen to the show and all of you who agree to be guests without you. I've gotten that thing, so thank all of you. One down, two to go, or one to go, whichever one. So yeah, here is my interview with Stacy Glick. Hey, Stacy. Welcome to the show. How are you today? Hi, I'm well, thanks. How are you? I am just spectacular. I can't tell you what a great honor this is. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, absolutely. It's nice to meet you and talk with you, Tommy, and I hope you can hear me okay. Oh, I can hear you just fine. Okay, great. Yeah, so looking forward to, to talking with you and answering any questions and uh, getting to know you a little bit. Awesome. So, going back in time, you were obviously a child actor. What age did you start gravitating toward acting? Um, I started acting when I was about eight years old, after uh, going to a Miss and Mr. Long Island contest where I grew up, and my brother and I were in the contest, and there was a manager in the audience that noticed my brother, and he was he's five years younger than I am, mm -hmm. and... Called, called him into audition, and I went with he and my mom, and they decided to have me audition as well, and the next week I was going out for commercials. Wow. So your parents weren't actors? Nope, nope, nope. We have, have no acting in my family, or had no acting in my family before um, my brother and I started. What uh, commercials uh, did you endorse? So, when I started auditioning when I was eight, um, the way it worked, and maybe it's still this way today, I don't know, you couldn't do book a national commercial without being in the union, but you couldn't get into the union without booking a national commercial. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of tricky um, to get that balance right, and so, and the union is Screen Actors Guild. So I was acting or auditioning for a while and not getting anything, and we were getting ready to sort of call it quits, and then I booked back-to-back um, -back national commercials and was able to get into the union, and that made things easier. So the first commercial I did was Thomas's English Muffins. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the ones with, uh, you do Thomas is good, Grandpa, um, with the nooks and crannies. And I did probably, I don't even know, 20 or 30 national commercials, Pillsbury chocolate chip cookies and Hostess cupcakes. I did the first commercial for McDonald's chicken nuggets mm -hmm. when McDonald's nuggets first were introduced. Um, yeah. And so it really was, was a very eclectic mix of things that led to eventually doing a soap opera for a year, which I did when I was in sixth grade, so I was about 11. And then I did some a couple of TV movies, um, and then eventually went on to Three O'Clock High and, and Brighton Beach Memoirs, which were the last two kind of major things I did. Yeah, I kind of remember that that, um, that McDonald's commercial scene is on YouTube like a few years ago or something. Yeah. Yeah, it was like, was like uh, you'll go nuggets for McNuggets. It was it was very silly and cute and amazing to think that um, you know all these years later they're still around. And that was I, Martha Quinn was in that commercial. Oh yeah, that was kind of a cool little yeah little little nugget of 
history. She was the original or one of the original MTV yep. DJs. You remember? Yep. And, and she's and she's a notorious vegan, so I'm so surprised she was in a McDonald's commercial for chicken nuggets. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. I didn't know that, but I wonder if she would now, you should get her on your show. I would wonder oh. if she would now admit that that was a commercial that she did. <laughs> well, I had Nina I had uh, Nina Blackwood on here last year. Oh, cool. You remember her? Um, yeah. Yeah. I do remember her. I do remember her. Yeah, I guess, you know, when you're of a certain age, you, you remember all of these things we're talking about. I know. Well, it's at the point now where so many people are forgetting, you know, so that's why I had this podcast so people will remember, you know. Yeah, that's very cool. I like it. It's very, very, very fun. Yeah. Did you uh, do any Broadway theater? I didn't do Broadway. I did off-Broadway. Um, I did a few shows, and at one point I was sort of offered to do the role of Lori, the character I played in Brighton Beach Memoirs, the movie, mm -hmm. um, for a Broadway run, but it was not something that worked out at the time with my schedule and, um, you know, everything else that was sort of going on. The play had been out already. It wasn't the start. Um, so it would have been, I would have been replacing the, the girl who was, who was in it at that time. But theater's tough for, for young kids. Um, you know, the, the schedule is just really, really difficult. So I, I did a little bit, but I didn't do a ton of it. Nice. Uh, does anything stand out though of, of the, of, of theater that you did do? Um, yeah, I would say that I did a, a show called 12 Dreams, which was a really dark but interesting play about, a young girl who is kind of haunted by dreams, um, very, very dark dreams, and has some, some really scary things kind of happening to her. And in the play she's working with, I believe it's her father who's a psychiatrist trying to figure out what's going on. And, um, you know, the dreams sort of act out in reality during the show. And mm -hmm. it was written by James Lapine. Um, before he did some of his bigger work. So it, you know, got really nice reviews and attention. It was reviewed in the New York Times, and it was a limited run at the Joe Papp Public Theater. So that was that was probably, you know, the, the most interesting um, piece of theater that I did. Great Ooh. cast, and Carol Shelley and Stefan Schnabel were a couple of the actors that were in it. They were longtime theater performers. Mm, God, Joe Papp. Yeah, I mean that's pretty prestigious for uh, for New York theater. Yeah, James Olsen was also in it. You know, names that I sort of remember um, hearing over the years. So yeah, that was cool. Very, very cool. And I acted with um, when I was on Search for Tomorrow, the soap opera, mm -hmm. which I was on for about a year. I had a recurring role on that, and <clears throat> that was at the time the longest running soap opera. Right. Um, I'm, I'm sure that it, it no longer holds that, that award, but it, it did back then. So they had incredible actors and people who were on that show for many years, and I worked with um, Jennifer Aniston's father, who just passed away, who was on that show for many, many years. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, Search for Tomorrow. I, people tell me, you know, Soap opera acting is like the hardest acting job because you have to memorize all these pages of dialogue and they will get pissed if you stop and they'll fire you and all of that stuff. <laughs> oh my goodness, that sounds pretty intimidating and harsh. I mean, I, I can't say I ever felt, um, you know, threatened that I was going to lose my job, but I will say it was the hardest thing I, I ever had to do in the sense that, yes, you're constantly getting new, new scripts and new lines and new scenes and, you know, having to to just produce a lot of, of memorization and material um, mm. on a daily basis. Um, so I think the one thing for me that was, I remember being the most challenging was I had been given a scene that morning. I kind of did what I had to do to make sure that I had everything, you know, memorized and set so I was prepared, but... 
I remember getting there one day and they had given me a new scene that was like a lot of dialogue. It was just me and one other one other actress and it was, you know, I don't remember how many pages, uh, enough pages and I remember getting overwhelmed and crying to my mother saying, I can't do this, I can't do this. And um, and I wound up doing it and getting it done. And, you know, at that point you're, you're doing, you know, there's more improv than full memorization because um, you just, there's just no way for most people to memorize that kind of material in such a short period of time, just a few hours. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you have to really rely on the actor or actors you're working with to, you know, kind of have that back and forth and, you know, get it get it out in the way that the, the writers intended, um, even if it's not word for word. So I remember that being super stressful. Um, but, of course, then everybody said it was, like, one of the best scenes I'd ever done. So, you know, mm-hmm. it, we were rewarded for, for our hard work. Um, but I think it was soon after that that I decided it was time to, to take a break from the soap opera and get back to school. I missed half the year of school that year. It was sixth grade. So I think I missed something like 52 days of school being on the soap opera. Wow. And uh, Cynthia Gibb was on there. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yep, she sure was. Yeah. It was really sweet. I remember her. The before yeah. fame. I mean, yeah, it was it was fun. It was definitely a, a great experience and one that, um, you know, was very different than anything else. Yeah. And challenging, of course, in many ways. We recently just lost John Aniston. Any good stories about him? Um, yeah, I don't, he and I didn't know each other well, but I recall him being very lovely and a very nice, nice, gentle man. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I was saying was that, you know, being on the soap opera for a year, you get to know those people pretty well because, mm-hmm. you know, you're working with them on kind of a daily basis, um, for an extended period of time. So it did feel very much like a family. Mm-hmm. And I think it was a really nice group of people. So I don't remember anything specific about him that I could share, but um, I remember overall everyone was really very, very wonderful, and it was a great experience. Nice. According to uh, IMDb, uh, the first movie you did was The Day the Loving Stopped, which was the TV movie of the week, and you got to work with the legendary Daniel Mann. How was that experience? Um, I love that Daniel Mann is legendary. <laughs> well, he well, go on, um, come back, little Sheba and the Rainmaker. <laughs> um, Daniel Mann was remind me the director. Yeah. Okay, I was going to say I don't have a very super strong recollection of of that movie. I was really young. That was the first thing I did. Yeah. I think I was only about nine years old. Right. Um, I do remember we filmed it in Arizona. Um, I remember seeing my first rainbow. Um, I remember working with Dennis Weaver and Valerie Harper. And I remember, who were lovely, mm-hmm. uh, Dennis was quiet. Valerie was amazing. Um, and I remember my um, my older sister, or, or the version of me as an older person, was played by Ali Sheedy. Right. So that was kind of cool. I played a young Ali Sheedy. Um, <laughs> so that was kind of cool. Um, but I don't remember much about Daniel Mann, I'll be honest. That's perfectly fine. Uh, Dominique Dunn? Yes, and Dominique Dunn was in that movie too. And of course, she died a very terrible, tragic death. Yeah, that was beyond tragic. Awful. Yeah. yeah, really, really terrible. Um so yeah, we didn't have too much to do with with Dominique Dunn and Ali Sheedy because we were me and the the girl who played my sister were you know we were the the younger one, so we didn't overlap in any scenes, obviously. Hmm. How does uh, the Banneker Gang come to you? Um, that was another kind of fun, interesting movie that we filmed locally. Um, I had a little bit of a smaller role in that, so I didn't spend a ton of time on that set, but that was a really cool, like, cute, adorable movie that yeah. I feel like not that many people saw, but it was yeah. really kind of a great movie and a great story and premise. Um, and, of course, Andrew McCarthy was the lead, so that was, you know, another one that was fun to work on and, and work with with a great actor and, and uh, great people. 
Yeah, I always liked that movie. It used to play on HBO a lot when I was a kid. And one thing about it I like is that um, Andrew McCarthy and Jennifer Dundas, about a year later, they played siblings again in the movie Heaven Help Us. And they are so good together as siblings that it's just it's, it's magical chemistry, I think. And oh, that's cool. I don't. Re- I didn't remember that, but I'll have to check out Heaven Help Us. Yeah, it's it's a coming of age teen Catholic school movie. You know, um, it's it's R rated, but it's a it's a great movie. It, it's it's like one of my top favorite teen movies of the eighties. I have to say. Yeah, I'm sure I saw it back in the day, but I don't remember it well. I'll definitely check it out. Yeah, Jennifer Dundas and I were often on um, you know auditions together. She and I were similar age and you know kind of yeah. um, up for the same role. And Martha Byrne played your sister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, how... I don't know what what they're doing if they're still acting. I feel like I've seen Jennifer Dundas like as an older actor. She's still working. I don't know about yeah Martha. Yeah, Jennifer Dundas played Goldie Hawn's daughter in the first Wives Club, and she has that great line, "Dad, I'm a lesbian, a big one." Funny. <laughs> <Honey. laughs> yeah. Great. Classic, classic. Yeah, and Ken Quappas uh, directed this movie. This was his first one before he directed Follow That Bird, uh, the Sesame Street movie. Oh, so cool. Yeah. So then... So then comes Neil Simon's Brighton Beach Memoirs. Uh, did you Did you see the Broadway show before? Um, well, that's a good question. I don't recall that I did see it before but maybe I did I mean I definitely saw it I don't I don't know if I saw it before or after mm-hmm. yeah that was another terrific I mean working with the that cast and crew was amazing they were top-notch yeah, this was this was the beginning of uh, Neil Simon's early years trilogy that he did. He had Brighton Beach Memoirs, Biloxi Blues, yep. which is my favorite, and Broadway Bound. Yeah, when I was yep. when I was in high school in the drama class, we all were assigned to do a Neil Simon play for a report, and I wanted to be in Biloxi Blues so bad, but I got in uh, The Odd Couple instead. Um, but uh, some some uh, what my friend was in the Brighton Beach Memoirs one, and he watched the movie, and he was like, "Man, that that Eugene is a pervert." <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, it was. It definitely did have have some of that for sure. But it was also you know full of heart and comedy and and you know great one liners, signature Neil Simon. You know, mm-hmm. he he was so brilliant, such a brilliant writer, and such a nice. Quiet man on set. He was there often. Yeah, what was great about him was that, you know, he came from, you know, being a comedy writer, you know, writing for Sid Caesar. And, like, whenever he would write a play, always had the best one-liners in it, like a like a, like a, um, a comedy writer would, you know. Whereas, you know, I don't think anybody else who hadn't been a comedy writer wouldn't have, have written dialogue that great as he did. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He was he was a comic genius, but in person he was really very understated and quiet. You know, you wouldn't necessarily know from from having a conversation with him. Yeah, so he was a nice man. Yeah, he was very very nice. I had really good experiences across the board um, with the people I worked with. Thankfully, I I you know really really had a situation where where I dealt with somebody who was you know difficult or nasty or challenging yeah so working with Jonathan Silverman was was great you two had good chemistry oh yeah he was amazing he is amazing um we all were very close and got along really well and um didn't stay in touch uh I mean we stayed in touch for a period of time after but then recently reconnected because they were doing you know another similar kind of anniversary special on on a podcast and we did like a video interview with a few of the cast members and Jonathan Silverman was on there so we reconnected which was very cool oh that is pretty cool yeah I'd, I'd like to see that uh, is it on YouTube um, yeah I could probably find it and send it your way 
um, I'd have to, to dig around. It was it was last year. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but... it was cool. It was great. It was for um, it was for the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival. Oh, okay. They were doing like a retrospective. Um, they were giving it, you know, some some credit for um, for being an important part of the Jewish film, um, you know, um, experience, and and it was, I think, the thirty fifth anniversary as well. Oh, that is so awesome! Yeah, I ever since I started the podcast, you know, I've I've become more aware of anniversaries more than anything. You know, this year I've been celebrating milestone anniversaries. I did last year, year before that, a little bit in twenty nineteen too. That's when I first re- realized I needed to start celebrating anniversaries of of my favorite landmark films and stuff. Nice, that's great. It's really great to be able to do that. Yeah, Bly- uh, Blythe Danner, um, who of course is Gwyneth Paltrow's mom, was Gwyneth on set? Um, she did come to visit, yeah, I did meet her uh, one time that I recall, um, so that was pretty neat. She and I are almost exactly the same age. Um, I turned 50 back in December, and she just turned 50, so, um, you know, we're, we're pretty close in age, and uh, at that time, she wanted to be acting, and, and her parents, wouldn't let her do it. They wanted her to wait until she was a little bit older. So, but she was, you know, lovely. Blythe was really, really lovely um, and so kind and, and sweet. Um, I bumped into her in the city a bunch of years back and reintroduced myself to her. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was kind of nice. Uh, yeah, just, you know, good good down-to-earth people. Uh, Judith Ivey, uh, Bob Dishy. Yeah, that's, yep. a, that's such a great cast. Yeah, it really, it really was a good cast and, and a great movie. I think they did a really nice job with it. When I watch it now, I, I you know, I'm still impressed with, with how, how well it held up. Yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of Neil Simon adaptations hold up, I have to say. He always got the best people to make them. You know, he had Gene Sachs for this. He had done The Odd Couple back in the 60s. That movie still holds up. Yep, amazing, amazing people. Yeah, I was I was just um, getting some stuff together because somebody in my town wants to interview me for um, an archive that they're doing, and they told me to pull some memorabilia from you know not only the work I'm doing now as a book agent, mm-hmm. but from the acting work I did as a kid. And so I was going around and finding some things, and I still have the director's chair that they had given everybody in the cast and crew um, for Brighton Beach Memoirs. It's like a professional director's chair. So that's kind of neat to have. That's so cool. Now we get to 3 o'clock high. Was that a standard audition for you? Um, was that a standard audition? I think so. I don't remember anything different or special about about it, to be honest. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I you know, at that time I was going on so many auditions for so many different things. They all kind of blend together. Um, so, yeah, I don't re- recall anything out of the ordinary with the audition process. Uh, you'll remember if you auditioned for Phil Juwanu or anything? Or, or well, something? eventually, yes. But at the beginning yeah. part, um, not necessarily. Um, I kind of remember more than, than that part of the process, just you know, getting to Utah where we filmed the movie and we were all there for six weeks and, you know, we were in this kind of very strange and different place. Most of us had come from either the West Coast or the East Coast and we were in the middle of Ogden, Utah, um, in the mountains, in the cold, um, you know, with a lot of people who were Mormon and, you know, had different beliefs that we were used to. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And we we lived in a hotel for six weeks, and it was during the um, 1986 um, Mets World Series. Yeah. So I remember watching and cheering for for the Mets, and that was super, super fun. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And, you know, just doing a lot of partying. I mean, at that point, I, I was a little bit older, so I was, you know, kind of... I was still young. I mean, I was only 14, but having acted for a bunch of years, you know, I was a little more mature probably than most 14-year-olds and, you know, I've been spending a lot more time with adults than most kids my age. So we, cr- 
created this really kind of cool, close-knit family that we had a, so much fun. I mean, it was like kind of a big party scene there. Even though we were in Utah, there was still, you know, a lot of a lot of fun stuff going on behind the scenes, a lot of partying. <laughs> wow. What, what, what did you think of the script? Because by this point, John Hughes had touched on many areas on teen life, um, but being bullied wasn't necessarily one of them. And you know, these guys, Richard Matheson and Tom uh, Zelossi, they wrote a clever uh, script for, you know, um, the, the old phrase, after school in the parking lot. Yeah, I thought that, you know, the script was, was really strong. I think you know, what brought it to life and what made it the classic that it became was Phil and his directing and his interpretation and his ability to, you know, not only get this team of actors together, but to direct what was really kind of a difficult and major undertaking. Uh, you know, there are some scenes in that movie that are just grand scale, epic, um, difficult, to film uh, and looking back and thinking about it, you know, what he had to do and how he was able to accomplish it is really remarkable. I mean, he was only 24 years old when, he, when we started filming. He wasn't even old enough to rent a car on the set. You had to be 25, I think you still do. And so he was kind of a kid, you know, but he had so much responsibility and he had so much talent. And he was able to do just incredible things. I mean, the fight scene, I think, is one scene that stands out as just amazing. And then the other one is the, the scene in the library where all the bookshelves fall over. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, like, the dominoes. And I, you know, sort of remember them setting that up. And I remember that Phil's parents were there visiting the set that day during that scene. And I remember the conversation of there's only one take. They have to get it right the first time. There's no, there's no second, second chance. And so there was a lot of pressure to make sure that that scene worked well. And I think it's when you watch it, it's just, you know, near perfect. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, Tyson is scary in this movie, and Casey is so vulnerable and so talented that you know he was coming off of playing smart asses and bully sidekicks like in Back to the Future, Stand by Me, and Secret Admirer. But uh, he should have been a huge star after this movie, I, I think. Yeah, he he's a very talented guy. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, I agree, super talented performers. Um, they chose older actors to do those roles, mm -hmm. which I thought was very, you know, in retrospect, kind of an odd maybe choice. Um, you know, I was the right age, and, and Anne, Anne was the right age. Tyler, who played, um, is that her last name, Anne Tyler? Anne Ryan. Um, Anne Ryan, sorry. Um, she was one of my very good friends at the time. Anne Ryan, you know, she and I were kind of similarly appropriately aged mm -hmm. for the movie, but Casey and Richard and Liza Dawson, who played the really pretty blonde, you know, they were all in their late 20s. Yeah. Which is kind of weird. Like, I don't really get why I cast, you know, folks that age for, for teenage roles. Uh, that's what they did back then, you know. Um, uh, uh, Robert Romanus, when he played Damone in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, he was 25. Yeah, I guess I guess it was a thing. I don't, you know, because it feels in some ways, I mean, the movie's amazing, don't get me wrong, but mm -hmm. a little inauthentic. You know, I think teens now would never, never buy that. I have, I have four teen girls myself. Yeah. And <laughs> I feel like when they want to go see movies about kids their age, they want them to be close enough, <laughs> you know, yeah. if, if not their actual age. Yeah. I'll, you know, what I love about Brie is that even though she's a little wisecracker, she genuinely loves her brother and she's there for him and she has self-awareness in ways that he doesn't. And so she'll guide him through it. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it, it's interesting because uh, one of the only characters in that movie that's not kind of a stereotype or caricature is Brie, right? Mm -hmm. She's kind of like the only voice of reason 
in the in the whole you know cast. Right. Everybody else is so over the top, and she's kind of the only one that's like you know sees what's going on and and feels like she knows how to manage it and, and doesn't understand why nobody can see what she can see, which is so obvious, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and um, what's his name? The 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 skinny guy with the red uh, with the red beret. He is hilarious in that. He steals the movie. Yeah, he is so funny. I don't know if he did anything else. I don't feel like he was really an actor before that. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't recall if I saw him in anything else. But he's got some great lines, you know, like uh, you know after. Um, after Jerry, yeah. after Jerry kisses the the teacher, he's like, "Now that's what I call a book report." <laughs> that's a great line. Uh, did you and Casey become close on set? Yeah, I'm very close with all, really all of the main actors, mm -hmm. and also with Phil. Um, Phil and I and Anne were very close, and um, we all kept in touch for quite a while after, um, at least a couple of years, um, until, you know, everybody sort of went, went their own direction. But, um, we had just a wonderful time. I think it was a little difficult for my mom. <laughs> um, she was the, she was the only parent on set because I, Anne and I were the only two minors. Mm -hmm. And so, and Anne was, I believe, 17 at the time. I was only 14. Um, so I had to be there with a parent and her mom had let her go, um, without her. So I think it was a little challenging, um, in that regard, <laughs> my poor mom, we were having a good time and, uh, you know, she was having to kind of manage being the only parent there. Yeah, I, I I always had a crush on Anne Ryan in this movie. I like that androgynous haircut she had and that mischievous smirk. She was just cute, I thought. I, I've tried getting her on the show, but no response yet. Uh, well, I think she moved. We were in touch a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. There's a few people over the past few years have reached out about this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and so I think we reconnected on social media, but she lives in Europe now. I think she lives in Ireland and runs a theater company. Yeah, I, I, yeah, she was in. Yeah, that's what I read too. She was in Ireland and she had a uh, a theater company or something. Yeah. Did did yeah. Um, did Casey's sister Nina show up? Um, I don't recall. Oh gosh, that's such a good question. Um, and now that you say it, I was going to say I don't recall meeting her, but uh, I kind of. Maybe did meet her at one point, <laughs> but I don't. I don't feel like it was during the movie. I feel like maybe it was after. Yeah, I talked to her a couple of years ago. Uh, she told me that uh, Casey is very reclusive these days, and um, really? yeah, and you know he he still works occasionally. Um, well, that's good. I mean, you know, it was an amazing group of people. I'm a little bit surprised that more of them didn't go on to be even more successful. Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe that movie somehow, you know, the tie, um, I mean, we had the best time, but, you know, for me, yeah, group and, like, be a kid and be a real teenager and, you know, kind of try to figure out the dynamic of, you know, going to a regular high school while having, like, this acting experience, and for me, that's, when I kind of decided, you know, over the next couple of years that I wanted to have a more traditional kind of mainstream life that wasn't going to include Hollywood and acting. Yeah. More traditional, more traditional life. You know, I wanted to go away to college and, you know, have a boyfriend and, you know, kind of just hang out with my friends. And, you know, that lifestyle for a kid is very, very challenging. And not at all what, you know, most kids are are doing on the day to day. Yeah. Yeah, but you had all this great talent behind this movie too. You know, you had Spielberg and Aaron Spelling. Barry Sonnenfeld did lighting for it. Yep. God, that's amazing. Um and this just just this great cast. Yeah, yeah. He was great. I remember him being really cool and really awesome. Who Sonnenfeld? Um, and close with Phil too. They were very close. 
Yeah. There's a podcast called Two Dollar Late Fee, and they they had um, Juwanu and Tyson and the guy who does the theme song on recently, and oh nice. I was like, how come they didn't you know find Stacy Glick? And so I'm glad I got in touch with you. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Um, oh, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think... I haven't heard Phil doing much of this kind of stuff either. I don't know if he kind of keeps to himself or, you know, what he's up to these days. Yeah, well, he did, He did like, a two-parter with them. And, he, he man, that guy has been there in Hollywood. He's He has stories, you know. Um, when he was with uh, Tyson and uh, Jim Walker, they were on for like two hours, and then he did a separate hour with wow. them late the, the following week. And I was like, wow, God, this guy has stories. Amazing. Yeah, he did a bunch of cool stuff after 3 o'clock high for sure. He did that U2 Rattle and Hum movie. Yep. And he did um, State of Grace, that Irish mob movie. Hello to him and you know, kind of got his attention. He was writing, he was filming, and he was writing on a huge camera. Um, and uh, and he did a bunch of cool movies after that. He did that Fatal Final Analysis. Oh, yeah. I think it was called. Um, so he definitely did. He, he's he done a lot. It. Yeah. I, I haven't heard much about him recently. Yeah, I, I I love your classic line, "cripple the dick." <laughs> yes, yes, that's the line that everybody remembers and knows so well. It knows and loves. When my kids first watched the movie, they afterwards were small, probably too small for them to be watching the movie. And one of my girls said, "Cripple the dick." <laughs> <laughs> love yeah. it. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. It's funny the movie was shot in Utah because I thought it was shot in Chicago all these years. No, it was Utah, and it was if you look in a couple of the outdoor scenes, you could see we're like deep down in the mountains. It was beautiful there. Did Did you ever attend the premiere of any of your movies? Yeah, I did. I went to the premiere um, for both. I recall. Uh, yeah, 3 o'clock high, definitely. We also filmed some extra scenes, so yeah. I had to fly out to L.A. They added the beginning. Um, I think when they did some screenings, they felt that there needed to be a little bit more context mm -hmm. of the family dynamic yeah. So um, and character introduction. Mm -hmm. So they added the, the scene of me and Jerry at the house, you know, with the microwave and everything. And then the car scene where he picks up um, Anne Ryan and, and, you know, we, we drive to the school. Nice, nice. So after 3 o'clock high, you finish school. Uh, and then you just said one day, I'm going to leave acting? Well, I did a few more things after 3 o'clock high, and then it was time to think about college. And, um, you know, my manager at the time was like an agent. were like, why don't you, you know, stay in New York and continue working? And I wanted to go away to school. And so I wound up going to Boston University. And for the first semester, there were a couple of auditions that I flew home for to New York. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was just too hard. I said, you know, I really, I, I can't, I can't do this. I need to just focus on school. And so I did. And the longer I, you know, was sort of focusing on school and doing other things, the, the more um, I decided that, you know, it was time for me to, to be done acting. Did, did you do any theater in college? I did not. I actually never took an acting class in my life. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're good. <laughs> it was just, you know, it was just like natural ability. You know, I was just kind of able to to do it without training and without, you know, studying. You know, I, I think if I continued, if it was something I felt I wanted to pursue, I would have, I would have studied and I would have, you know, certainly done more. I wound up studying film and psychology in college. Mm -hmm. So... My thought was that um, I was either going to become a therapist 
or a literary agent. No, I'm kidding. I, I didn't think I'd become a literary agent. I don't even think I knew then what a literary agent was. But, yeah. Um, but, I, but I thought I would wind up behind the scenes. I thought maybe I would become a producer or a director or a writer um, or, you know, some combination of all of those things with my, with my acting experience and background and having been on sets and having, you know, seen productions unfold and things like that. Mm-hmm. So that's why I studied film. And then when I graduated, I moved back to New York. I grew up um, outside New York City. And I was working in film and TV development here for about six years. And I was planning to move to L.A. I was thinking I would, you know, the opportunities in New York were, were and still are limited when, you know, it comes to Hollywood, right? Yeah. And so my thought was to move to L.A. I had a trip planned. I was doing all these informational meetings and I was going to be doing script coverage and, you know, thinking I was going to make my way out there. And then right before I left, I met my um, husband on a blind date. <laughs> <laughs> and that threw everything into a, a tizzy and um, my plans got completely derailed and here we are, you know. Yeah, I, I, had, years, I had never... Yeah, I had never heard the term literary agent until I started uh, the podcast. Now I hear it all the time because I have people come on promoting books and stuff. Yeah, so what's your job function? Uh, My job function is I work with authors Mm -hmm. and I help them develop um, book projects that I sell to publishers. So I am sort of their literary creative agent and manager. I do the actual selling, Mm -hmm. but also the creative development for for books. So, you know, in an ideal world, like I have authors I've worked with for, you know, close to 20 years. We've done five books, six books, more books, um, really across every category. I do books for children. I do books for adults. I do fiction. I do nonfiction across multiple categories. And so, yeah, it's a very creative endeavor. I mean, it's a little bit like if you want to compare it to making a movie <laughs> on a much, much smaller scale. And, um, you know, you're able to, to work on a lot of different projects at once, mm-hmm. um, which is great. And, you know, you work with a lot of really smart, interesting, creative, talented people. And, you know, I can kind of make it what I want to make it. I can work from home, which is great. I have four kids and two dogs. And so I'm able to, you know, have a flexible schedule, which I've had long before COVID. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And so, you know, it's worked out really, really kind of nicely. But it it, it can be stressful at times? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, like any job and career, um, when you're dealing with talent, there there are things about it that are challenging. I feel like my... um, my studies and my education in psychology helped me enormously to deal mm-hmm. with some of the personality challenges that come up. Um, you know, trying to support my clients and work with editors and, and deal with some of the things that, um, you know, in any relationship can be challenging when you're trying to develop something creatively. There's always um, differences of opinion and disagreements and, you know, feelings that are sometimes hurt. <laughs> or, um, you know, people who, who feel angry about one thing or another. But, you know, my job is to is to keep everything and everyone on track and make sure that um, the book gets where it needs to be and can be published successfully. Nice. So you enjoy it and uh, you have a lot of, um, do, you, do you have a lot of well-known uh, authors that you're proud of? I do, yeah. I have, I have some amazing authors. I sell... I don't know, probably 15 to 25 books a year, I would say, in an average year. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've had, you know, New York Times bestsellers. I've had books that have won awards. Um, Ideally, uh, you know, sometimes both of those things will happen simultaneously. Um, And then, you know, I think even more importantly than that, I feel like I just want to be able to to help make books that, that help people live better lives. So that can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. But ultimately, you know, books that inspire me um, to, 
want people to take something away and feel better about themselves. You know, those are the books that, that are most important to me right now. So I do a lot of mental health. I do a lot of um, women's issues, mm-hmm. um, female empowerment, um, especially the last few years with COVID. Mm-hmm. Like I have books coming out about ADHD for women and a book about chronic pain. And um, I do lots of cookbooks and food books and, you know, lifestyle books and health and wellness and psychology and self-help books in all those categories. I have six books out from a woman named Amy Morin. I just sold her, her sixth book. It's um, 13 Things Mentally Strong Couples Don't Do. Yeah. first book was 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. Um, and she's terrific. She's a therapist, and she runs Very Well Mind, which is a, a big mental health website. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a book about the future of medicine coming out from a Harvard doctor. Um, so it really runs the gamut, but, you know, I think, I think there is that theme of, of, you know, trying to help people either be inspired or live better lives. Like I, I did a book, I have one book that's actually in film development right now. Oh, nice. So I always look for projects that can be adapted into movies. Um, and one is, is actually in production. It's called The Widow Co. Mm-hmm. And it's by a woman named Tilar Matteo, who's a, an English professor. And it's about... Um, the founder of Booth Co, mm-hmm. whose husband died in the 1800s, and she took over and ran Booth Co and kind of created what it is today. Mm-hmm. So she was like the Martha Stewart of her day. She was an incredible woman. Um, so that, after over 10 years of development, just started production, which is incredible. It's, it's filming, obviously, in France and Champagne. And um, has, a, has a good cast. It was just written up in Deadline. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember the name of the actors, but I can tell you if you if you want to see it, I can send you the article about it. Okay. Um, and then um, and then what else? And then I have uh, a few other projects that are sort of in active development that are hopefully going to be made into movie into movies at some point. I have an A list actress hasn't yet been announced, so I can't say who, but yeah. an A list actress who's attached to. Um, a book by the same woman, actually, who did The Widow Clicquot. Um, it's called Irina's Children, and it's about Irina Semler, who saved 2,500 Jewish kids during the Holocaust in Poland. Mm-hmm. She's known as the Oscar, female Oscar Schindler. Oh, yeah. She actually saved even more um, kids than, than Oscar did. Um, and she was just this incredibly inspiring, amazing woman who lived to be um, almost 100 years old and was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize the year that Al Gore won. And um, her story is just really remarkable, and, and when it gets made, it will, will be an amazing movie. Oh, that is so awesome. Look at you. I mean, that is just a success story and a half. I really love hearing that, Stacy. I really do. Uh, well, good. Thank you. Yeah, so I've, you know, continued to, to kind of be behind the scenes creatively, and very, very different ways, but, um, but very satisfying and rewarding ones, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm passionate about uh, women's empowerment as well. I've been called a feminist by many um, because I have, I have a lot of my like-minded actress friends come on the podcast and we talk about sex and sexuality, you know, and not, not, not too many other podcasts do that, you know, and it's, it's something I've been passionate about for a long time. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lucky guy. Excellent. Well, that's terrific, and I appreciate you reaching out to me and having the chance to, to talk a little bit about, you know, this part of my life that is, is a very, very ancient history in some ways, but um, incredible that people are still loving it, loving the movie and, and interested in talking about it, learning more about it, and it's, it's really cool to have been a part of it. Yes. We got to play by Secret Silly Game. Uh, this is a series of silly slumber party questions. No win or lose, just pure benign fun. And how the game works is I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me that exact same question and I answer it. And feel free to comment on answers because they might be funny. Okay. I've never played anything like that before, but sounds good. Okay. Stacy, are you ticklish? Yes. Are you? Yes. Um, if you tickle me without warning, though, I might hit you in the groin. <laughs> yeah, it's not 
not my it's not my favorite thing. I don't like to be tickled without warning. <laughs> <laughs> um, is your belly button an innie or an outie? An innie. Is your belly button an innie or an outie? It's an innie. Um, what color are your toenails painted? Um, gray. How about you? <laughs> right now they're not painted. Last time they were, they were Easter egg blue green. Lovely. Yes. Um, what would you say is your best personality trait? Oh my goodness. Best personality trait. Well, my husband's standing right here, so maybe we could say, what's my best personality trait? Ability to get along with anyone. I agree. I agree. <laughs> oh, thank you. How about you? Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a Gemini, so I have empathy, but I also have no filter. <laughs> that could be a good thing and a bad thing, a blessing and a curse. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then You're my... Gotten into, into trouble at times, but, but worth it. Yes. And then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? Um, oh, I, I guess there are many. Um, I mean, certain body, body, body odors. Um, I have a new puppy. I stepped in poop yesterday, so that was pretty unpleasant. Um, <laughs> but I, I guess to switch it around, I love the smell of gasoline. Okay. That's pretty bad. And, Yes, I love going to the gas station, opening the windows, and just inhaling the smell of gasoline. And I had it when I was little. I had a scratch and sniff sticker that was gasoline, and it was my favorite. <laughs> a little weird. Yeah. Quirky. Uh, um, and how about you? Uh, either farts or feet. Yeah, feet can be really gross. Yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Stacy, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on today. And even though we had technical uh, difficulties and stuff, it, it turned out great. Oh, I'm so glad. Well, thank you for having me. And um, if there are any follow up questions from you or your listeners, let me know. I sure will. And I sent you a Facebook friend request. And uh, you have yourself a happy, happy holiday season. And be safe out there. Thanks. You too, Tommy. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Well, there you have it. Stacy Glick, ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, what a great lady, huh? I'm so glad that she's doing what she loves and she's helping women. And, God, they got, they got, they got books there that are going to be made into movies. That's fucking awesome. I love hearing that stuff. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past. Because the present sucks. Later, dudes.